Today I'm going to do something that's pretty well, I don't think I've ever done it like this before. I usually try to jam all kind of scripture in when I teach or preach. But I'm not going to give you a whole lot of scripture today. But I've got, I've got so many sources and uh, poets and songwriters and authors and people and Spurgeon and Moffat and all these that I've gotten information from in the last week or so. And it all fits together for Thanksgiving. So I'm not apologizing. I think you'll get something out of this. But Father, I thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your people. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you just speak through me. Hide me behind the cross and let Jesus be exalted. And we give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen. Amen. Tell your neighbor I'm going to listen today. All right. I want to begin today with four words that I hope to burn in your mind and your heart this Thanksgiving. And here it is. Here we go. Well, scoot up. Add it all up. That's the four words that I want you to take home with you today. Add it all up. And I'll tell you what it's about in just a minute. But uh, don't you you just love being in the house of God? You know, I I don't know about you all, but it's just like I look forward to this every single week. Hearing the word, being in worship service, being in the presence of God, being with each other. Did you know that God created you to be a blessing to other people? Amen. Amen. Not to be a curse. Be a blessing. The Apostle Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 4 when he was correcting and giving direction to the Corinthians. Because we know that the Corinthian church had all the gifts and all the stuff, but they they didn't walk in love. They were competitive, jealous of each other. You know, God has called us to communion and not competition. But he was correcting them in 1 Corinthians 4 because they were showing favoritism over one minister over the other. Who are you to say, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas or Peter, I'm of Jesus. You know what? We're all together, one in him, and we're for all of these. But he says in the NIV, 1 Corinthians 4, 7, for who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Listen to Peterson in the message. For who do you know that really knows you, knows your heart? And even if they did, is there anything they would discover in you that you could take credit for? Isn't everything you have and everything you are sheer gifts from God? So what's the point of all this comparing and competing? Any gift that we have is from God. Anything that we have is from God. I don't care who signs your paycheck, it's from God. Well, you know, but I've earned this. That's good. Who gave you health to get out of bed and go to work in the morning? Who gave you health where you don't have to be in the best hospital in Peoria today, but you can be in the house of God? Think of this for a minute. So these, these four words I found from a story about a very proud and arrogant young man. He just recently graduated from college with a 4.0. Mine was a point four, <laughs> And was now a certified CPA. Years earlier, his dad had migrated to the U.S. and now owned his own little business. So Mr. Arrogant began to criticize his father's way of keeping books. He said, Dad, you don't even know how much profit you've made. Over here in this drawer are your accounts receivable. Over there are your receipts. And you keep all your money in the cash register. You have no idea how much you've made. Now, Dad's response is the one I want you to catch here. The father answered, Son, when I came to this country, the only thing I owned was a pair of pants. Now your brother's a doctor, your sister's an art teacher, and you're a CPA. Your mother and I own our own home. We have a car, and we own this little business. Now, add it all up, subtract the pants, and the rest is all profit. <laughs> Isn't that, doesn't it say it all? What a perfect, great story for Thanksgiving. And you know what? We need to individually and corporately add it all up. You started it out today, Brother Allen, with... 
a heart of thanksgiving. I was going to say that I was most thankful for a perfect wife. I mean that. When I talk to other guys about their wives and we talk about each other, I always tell them, you know what? God gave me and you the perfect wife for us. Two months, we're going to hit 50 years. Ain't that something? Yeah, I don't need an applause, but we need to add it all up. Let's go on. Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 7. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. Like, I think it was a bumper sticker. I've heard this before. He who dies with the most stuff still dies. And that's something. Add it all up. We came into the world with nothing but the eternal soul that God has given us, and everything else is profit. Have you ever thought about how blessed you are that you're not laying somewhere in a bed sick, laying on the curb, throwing up on yourself from having such a great party last night? Boy, didn't we have fun. It was all fun till the cops came and Jerry got arrested. Oh, my head's about this big around. I can't hardly stand up. I'm real dizzy, but boy, didn't we have fun. Everything else is profit. 1 Timothy 6, verse 8. If we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. You know, the enemy kicks our rear ends many times because we're not content with what we have. Got to have more. Got to have more. I don't know how many of you ever bought a camper. Anybody ever had a camper? Don't. None of you ever had a camper. But you had a camper. Oh, Darla. The camper, the two foot itis, the boat. You ever had a boat and you get two foot itis? You got to get a bigger one. Got to have a motorhome. Oh, that's only 26 footer. Let's get a 29. Oh, that 29 is too small after a year later. Let's get a 31. Let's go with a 40 footer. Got to have more. Got to have more. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. Uh, Peterson says it this way, since we entered the world penniless and will leave it penniless, if we have bread on the table and shoes on our feet, that's enough. I mean, we say that, but in our heart of hearts, it's like, I've got to have more than bread. and more. We have so much to be grateful for. Yesterday at the men's by, uh, prayer breakfast, we, did, we had, did have two friends of mine. One's a, a pastor that we met up there at uh, Aunt Jenny's. And we're talking about this and that and the, kind of get to know each other. They came to the men's prayer breakfast yesterday morning. We had a really, really good time. Had a good meal, good fellowship. Uh, we got a lot, a lot to be. And Jay Dog taught, gave a lesson on Thanksgiving. And some of the stuff that you shared, I'm going to repeat. If you don't mind, that's okay. Nelson Bible Dictionary says it this way, and I'll just give you the address. I won't read the verses because there are several here. Nelson says this about Thanksgiving is the aspect of praise that gives thanks to God for what he does for us. We give praise to him for what he does for us. Ideally, he says, Thanksgiving should spring from a grateful heart, but it is required of all believers regardless of their initial attitude. We're going to talk about tudes here a little bit later. Attitudes. We should be grateful to God for all things. He writes in Ephesians 5.20, Colossians 3.17, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, but especially for his work of salvation and sanctification. We ought also to thank God in anticipation of his answering our prayers, Philippians 4.6, knowing that his answers will always be in accord with his perfect will for our lives, Romans 8, 28 through 29. So there's a story of a poor man who was given a loaf of bread. He thanked the baker... And the baker said, don't thank me, thank the miller who made the flour. So he thanked the miller, but the miller said, don't thank me, thank the farmer who planted the wheat. He thanked the farmer, but the farmer said, don't thank me, thank the Lord. He gave the sunshine and rain and fertility to the soil, and that's why you have bread to eat. I've talked about my mom many times in the past. I never met a more thankful person in my whole entire life. I mean, you, you name it, you name it. She was thankful. Say so whenever she'd get a, a, a thing of water, 
cup of water. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this water. Oh, Lord, thank you for th Thank you for this cup, Lord, that holds this water. Lord, thank you for indoor plumbing. Thank you for, thank you for water. I mean, it's just like, okay, I get it. You're thankful. She's one of the most thankful people. But Peter said this, that God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, I just quoted that, but I didn't give you the verse, in everything, say this, in everything. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. We should be ready at any time to share the hope that we have with those around about us. I believe that we carry a hope inside of us that the world doesn't have because they don't know Jesus and they didn't read the final chapter where we read it and it says that we win. Amen. Okay? In everything give thanks. In everything. He didn't say for everything, but in everything. In everything, set this way, add it all up. In everything, add it all up. And see to it that you maintain an attitude of gratitude. I think this, this right here, when we have a hope and when we are grateful and thankful to God around us to let people around us know that we're thankful for these things, I think this should be a calling card to the unsaved. You are so thankful. And, and the hope, of, why aren't you depressed? Didn't you hear who got elected and who didn't get elected and what they're going to do next? In all things, in everything, give thanks. You can tell me thanks if you want for being able to sit on them pews. Some people want to rip the pews out and throw them away. Uh-uh, ain't going to happen. I like the pews. So, let's go on. I found something pretty cool in John 6. I shared this with the men yesterday. But this is really interesting. I hadn't noticed it before. This is the time when all the multitudes of people were following Jesus and, and they were all hungry. You remember in, in John 6 where I think it was Philip and said, how are we going to feed all these people? And Jesus tested him to see where he was at. And he failed the test. But here's what happened. There was a young boy, you know the story, that had five loaves and two small fish. Y'all know the story. And they were, multiply, they were miraculously multiplied. They fed 5,000 men, not counting the wives and the children. And they had 12 baskets of food left over. Can you imagine? I remember years ago, brother Jimmy, Jimmy, hey Jimmy, you'll like this one. Jim and I used to be neighbors. And we were neighbors to Skip. And y'all remember Skip? That there chicken gut of fungus. I mean, all the, all the brainstorm things that Skip would come up with. Hmm. I remember we had him come over one time. We lived out there for a couple of years. Had him come over to our house, Deb fried chicken, mashed potatoes, gravy, you name it. Dude, it was something to be thankful for. Ate all we wanted. There was still food left on the table. We got done eating. Skip looks at Deb. She, he said, you know, you know, Sister Debbie? If you don't mind, I'd like to take the rest of that chicken home with me. I could eat it when it's late tonight. I got two boys growing up that eat like hogs. You can never keep them full over 15 minutes at a time. And here's Skip saying, if you don't mind, I'm going to take all the rest of that chicken home with me. I'm sorry. I didn't have the faith to bless it and multiply it like Jesus did here. But I want to show you the key. I believe it's a key to the miracle that took place here. This is great. John 6, 11. Then Jesus took the loaves, and say this with me, will you? Gave thanks to God. And distributed it to the people. Afterward, he did the same. Say, did the same. With the fish. And they all ate as much as they wanted. Are you seeing the key to the miracle? What did Jesus do twice? He gave thanks. Why didn't he just say, Lord, thanks for the bread and the fish. Multiply it, Father. I believe that there was a key here that he is showing us that we should look beyond the bread, beyond the fish, to him who provided it. Let's go on. Then, prior to Jesus' departure to heaven, he did a similar thing at the Lord's Supper. Luke twenty two seventeen 17 says, Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Verse 19, Then he took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. I believe having an attitude of that 
that way will make us a candidate for the miraculous. Somebody say, wow. I'm telling you, when we become extremely grateful, we open ourselves up for a potential miracle in our life. Someone said yesterday, you ever had your kid ask for something, you give it to them, they go, yeah, thanks. When you want to just say, fine, give it back to me. Have we ever done that to God? Jesus blessed the cup, he blessed the juice, the blood, and made miracles possible. To be thankful makes the impossible possible. Yeah, but I don't like where I'm at. I don't like what I'm going through. I don't know where God's at. I don't know why he's doing this to me. I just don't. You know, you know what? In all things, in everything, be thankful. In all things, be thankful. You want to open yourself up for a miracle? Be extremely thankful. In fact, let your thanks come out of your mouth to let people know around you, I'm thankful to God. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. I have eternal life. Man, heaven is my home. This earth can perish and burn to a crisp. I'm thankful. So just consider the attitude of that proud CPA and the attitude of the Laodicean church who said they had need of nothing, but they were actually spiritually bankrupt. The sad thing is some people have a mixed up attitude because their priorities are all mixed up. Are you all hearing this? Anybody here ever been betrayed, be betrayed by a friend? Yeah. Just Greg. Oh, Greg. Check this one out. There's a story of a man who was betrayed by a friend. Greatly wounded, he obeyed Jesus' words in Matthew 15 and went privately to the man and said, Don't you remember who picked you up when you were in the gutter? Don't you remember who bailed you out of jail and loaned you money when you needed it? Don't you remember who gave you your first job? The man replied, yes, you did. But what have you done for me lately? Do we ever have that kind of an attitude? Let me, let me tell you something. People talk about living in the good old days. Did you know the living Bible says don't look back to the good old days? Those aren't the good old days. These are the good days. We're alive, we're healthy, we're, we're blessed. It's Thanksgiving. But I think sometimes we're that way with God. Well, what, what have you done for me lately? God, do you remember when you used... The Holy Spirit is like the tide. Sometimes the tide's in, sometimes the tide's out. I mean, we can time it. We realize that it's, it goes along with the, with the time of the day. But we cannot force the hand of the Holy Spirit to move when he's not moving. Many times during a service at the end of worship, I'm at, I'm at a fork in the road. Lord, do you want us to just get up and share the word? Do you want us to have hands on ministry? Do, I, do you want the body to lay hands on the body? Because I'm not, I'm not the one man show. I don't believe in a one man show. I believe in body ministry. I crave a move of the Holy Ghost. I crave the day when we can have people laying all around here like a bunch of drunks passed out on the floor. I've been there. I've seen that. I've seen the miraculous. I've cast out demons. We've done the works of God. But the Holy Spirit moves at His own accord. I believe when we become thankful more thankful for other than just the fact that we have a warm building to come together and hang out with each other. I believe when we become thankful for the Holy Ghost living in us and the gifts of God that's deposited in us, that that thankfulness will begin to manifest itself in the supernatural and the miraculous and the Holy Ghost will show up. You ever gone to somebody's house when you go in and they've been arguing and you just, I'm sorry, I, I got a root canal. I got to go get done right now. <laughs> I believe that when we are most thankful and most grateful to God, that's when God shows up. And what's he say? In your presence is what? Fullness of joy. What do you say we start being thankful not only for a nice building and nice people and a wonderful pastor that we, 
that we become thankful to God and be thankful that the Holy Spirit wants to move more than we want to see Him move. But we cannot fabricate. One of these days, Dan and I are going to sing a song together. In fact, he's been working on it. I don't know. It might even be ready, but it's probably not ready now. It's by Larry Fleet. I told you about this song, Where I Find God. That's where I find God. Anybody heard that yet? That's where I find God. You really need to look that up. It's where he takes worldly things and reveals the works of God in his life. I mean, I've listened to this song 40 times, and I finally saw it for the first time the other day. Listen to one verse. Did you say, well, you're going to sing that in church? You doggone right. The night I hit rock bottom sitting on an old bar stool, he paid my tab and put me in the cab. He didn't have to. But he could see I was hurting. Oh, I wish I'd got his name because I didn't feel worth saving, but he saved me just the same. Are you hearing this? Thankful hearts. He had the right attitude, didn't he? After all, who does deserve salvation? Who deserves to be saved? Look at the person next to you and say, certainly not you. Huh? How often when life gets tough do we tend to say, God, you said you'd never leave me or forsake you, but where are you at? Where are you at, God? We may not say it, but have we ever thought? What have you done for me lately, God? The question is, if God never did another thing for you the rest of your life, would you still be faithful? Would you still serve him to the end? Winston Churchill once told a story about a sailor who rescued a drowning boy. He pulled the boy out of the water, administered artificial respiration, revived him, and sent him on his way. That afternoon, the boy and his mother were walking down the street, and they met the sailor. The boy told his mother, that's the man who saved me. The mother immediately turned to the sailor and asked, is it true? Did you pull my boy out of the water this morning? The sailor proudly replied, yes, ma'am, I did. But to his surprise, instead of thanking him, she shook her finger in his face and demanded, well, where's his cap? See, God provides us with so much, and yet we demand, where's the rest of your promises? I remember years ago when we were looking for a building. We looked at every vacant building in Pekin area, and you name it, we looked them over, looking for a building. I was in our basement building one time. One guy, when he came to minister, a professional artist, came to minister, said he got out of his car and said, well, that building must be built for midgets. It's only three feet tall. The rest of it was underground. And I remember I was moaning and groaning to God. God, when are you going to give us a building? We've been looking for a building. We've been saving our money. We've been waiting for this. We're waiting for that. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, I want to tell you right now, until you quit complaining, we're not giving you anything else. Hello? Are we hearing it today? What is our attitude regarding God's blessings? Well, you owe it to me. I've been in the ministry since November of 85. You owe me. God doesn't owe us anything but salvation because we've accepted Jesus Christ. I recently found an article that relates to the subject. Written by Leslie Dixon Weatherhead a Christian poet and author in the early 1900s. So listen to what he said. He told about eating with a couple in northern England right after World War II. Men, put your ears on on this one, okay? Food was still scarce, but the wife managed to prepare a fine meal of fresh trout from a nearby stream and some fresh vegetables cooked in a delightful way. He enjoyed the meal greatly, and when it was over, thanked his hostess for it. She blushed rather shyly and said, Oh, sir, my husband never thanks me when I prepare a fine meal for him. Weatherhead said that he felt a little embarrassed for the husband, but he discovered that the husband was not embarrassed at all. He said that he could still see the man sitting there saying, Hey, love, I would have told you if I didn't like it. That's a thankless attitude. One man said it this way. If we fail to become thankful, we can very easily become bitter, discouraged, arrogant, and self-satisfied. 
In fact, I found an article last week, uh, Karen gave it to me, comes in a weekly little one-page thing, little article from Rick Warren. And uh, let, me, let me read this. It's about having a good attitude and gratitude. A good attitude and gratitude will improve your brain and physical health. Proverbs 17, 22. It creates happiness. Psalm 126, 3. It's the antidote to toxic emotions. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. It improves relationships. Get Think of that. You ever been around Miss, Miss Grouchy? Complainer? You love to hang around with them? Oh, I'm telling you, I'm just go. I'm gonna hang out with that person, man. They gripe and complain all the time. They, when I leave, I am really built up and edified. I feel really good about things. A good attitude and gratitude improves relationships. It opens the evidence of spiritual. I'm sorry. It provides the evidence of spiritual maturity. How about that one? Being grateful and thankful to God reveals spiritual maturity or a lack thereof. It pleases God and brings blessings. Psalm 50 verse 23. It opens the door to people and opportunities. Can you imagine you've got a business and you want to hire somebody and they come in and they're just down in the dumps and moaning, groaning about, complaining about everything under the sun? Well, we're going to put you in the, in the HR department because you can cheer up all these good people. So as I said, people with a mixed up attitude, it's because their priorities are mixed up. But people who have a realistic attitude, their priorities are unmixed. Here's another story that uh, we'd be able to relate to. There was once a couple who immigrated from Romania from the Iron Curtain when the Iron Curtain collapsed. They came because they wanted religious freedom. They said that in Romania, the government allowed them to, watch this, have worship assemblies on the Lord's Day, but there would always be soldiers present listening and reporting on everything being said. The authorities allowed public services where everything could be monitored, but it strictly was against the law to gather in homes and discuss the Bible and even what had been said in the public services. The soldiers would often follow people as they left the church services. If you took someone home with you and the authorities discovered you had read the Bible together, oftentimes the host would be arrested and could spend months in jail because of it. I heard on the news the other night there was an 84-year-old pastor with a group of people at an abortion clinic outside on the sidewalk praying. They were praying. They got arrested. This 82-year-old pastor was put in jail for 12 years. 12-year prison sentence. I think this type of stuff could be happening in America before long. How thankful are we? You know what? Where we are today, we need to be really grateful, really thankful. Sometimes we have a problem being thankful when we take things for granted just like the woman cooking the good meal. It's like parents who provide their kids with everything they want, but the kids don't appreciate it because they have no skin in the game. This is partly what's wrong with our entitling, entitlement mentality. So during this Thanksgiving season, it seems appropriate to add it all up. Don't you think we need to add it all up, subtract the pants, and realize how blessed and fortunate we are. How many of you like Max Lucado? Listen to what he said. I wake up in a world of miracles every morning. Every time I breathe and use the oxygen and incorporate it into my body, it is a miracle. Every time I open my eyes and see the beauty that surrounds me, that's a miracle. Every time I touch the hand of a baby, that's a miracle. Every time I take a morsel of food and put it into my mouth and chew it and my body digests it and uses the energy from it, that's a miracle. I was going to add this in here. Deb said every morning she wakes up and sees me. It's a miracle she's still there. Lakato continues, just as surely as it was a miracle when God opened the waters of the Red Sea, just as surely as it was a miracle when Jesus fed the multitudes, just as surely as it was a miracle when Jesus healed the blind man, we wake up in a world of miracles every day, and some of us have the audacity to want more. So today I'm asking you to add it all up, add the tremendous blessings that God has given to you and poured upon you, and think of all the times that he's bailed you out of trouble. 
I think the number one thing that I want to find out when I get to heaven is how many times I came close to getting killed doing something stupid. <laughs> right, Jer? We can relate. Think of the times he has supernaturally provided your needs. You ever been at the place where you didn't know how you were going to pay for something and all of a sudden a check comes in the mail? Yeah. You got a refund, $10,000. Yeah, yeah, right? I'm still looking for that one. What about the many, many, many times he's healed you from sickness and disease? The times that he's spared you when you should have been crushed between whatever it was. How about this? Think about the eternal life that he's provided for me and you with his. And it came, you know what? It was unmerited. It was unearned. It was undeserved. Yet he gave. There's a hymn composed in 1897. In fact, we used to sing it. Written by Johnson Ottoman Jr. When up on life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Anybody ever used to sing that hymn? Count your blessings. Name them one by one. God never promised us a bed of roses, and we know that not everything that happens in life is good. But we have this reassurance that Paul wrote in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to His purpose. God has promised that if we will love Him and let Him work in our life, He will work all things together for our good. What Paul writes in Philippians 4.12, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And everybody said amen. I want to share one more story. There's a man who decided to fly his lighter-than-air balloon all the way around the world. All right there, that guy needed help. So on day one, he planned to fly from city A to city B. But a wind came along that he hadn't counted on, and he found himself being forced to land in city C. He didn't know much about city C, but that is where he found himself. So he stayed there for a while and discovered that it was a pretty nice place to be. He saw all the sights, enjoyed the people, and made new friends in city C. Then he decided to fly from city C to city D. But another contrary wind came and forced him to land in City E. He didn't even know that City E existed, but there he was. So he met the people, absorbed their culture, looked at all the sites, and made new friends in City E also. He finally made his way around the world, not exactly landing everywhere he had planned, landing in different places from time to time, but finding blessings everywhere he went. Can we, can we apply that to us? There's blessings around us at all times if we would just look. If we would just look. So, we might be at point A, thinking you're going to point B. Something happens, you'll find yourself at point C. And uh, that wasn't all that, that uh, we had planned. But we unexpectedly find blessings at point C that we didn't even know existed. That's not what I planned on. I didn't think it was going to take this turn. I didn't know we were going to end up here. Why didn't somebody tell me? It doesn't matter. You ended up where God wants you to be. So wherever you are today, whatever you're going through today, in all things, be thankful. Have an attitude of gratitude. Pray that in the situation you can learn to be content. Another thing to do is pray and ask where the source of the opposition is coming from. Have I gotten myself into pride? And God says, I resist the pride, which means he sets himself at war. You want God to be set himself at war? And is it because of pride? Is it something, have I sown the wrong seed? Should I pray for a crop failure? Anybody ever pray for a crop failure? We all have. Is it the enemy? Do I need to humble myself, submit myself to God, resist the devil, make him flee? But in all things, be grateful, be thankful. So let me, let me, before I close this and turn the order of the service, because we want to receive the Lord's Supper. This, this is really cool, especially for those of you that like to go through Strong's Concordance and look up definitions of other words. Check this out. In Strong's Concordance, I discovered five, uh, three Hebrew words, three Hebrew words, along with several scriptures that are used in, but I'm not going to give you them. We don't have time. 
Then in the New Testament, I found five Greek words and several scriptures where they're used. And all of this is for either the word thanks or thanksgiving. Okay. Most Old Testament words had the thought of holding out the hand, giving thanks, and reverencing and worshiping God. However, one Hebrew word expanded the definition to include these words. Adoration, confession, offering, and the word avow. A-V-O-W-A-L. Avow. I see some of you thinking, what, what is avow? I'm glad you're thinking that. Let me tell you the definition. Avow is an open declaration or acknowledgement. An open declaration or acknowledgement. Then, in the Greek, thanksgiving is gratitude due to the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in life. It also means covenant and promise. Now, here it gets interesting. Several verses in the New Testament use the word thanks, which in the Greek, try to say this after me, eucharistia. Eucharistia, okay? Eucharistia. What's the English transliteration? What word do we get out of Eucharistia, which is talking about Thanksgiving? Eucharist. You know what Eucharist is? Communion. Fellowship. So today I'm going to invite you to join us to receive the Lord's Supper, better known as communion, which as described as a vowel or a corporate act of grateful worship. Okay? So we're not just going to go through the motions because we're supposed to do it. It's a corporate act of worship from hearts of thanksgiving. We're acknowledging and reminding God of the covenant and promises that he made with us, his children. It's time that we add it all up, what it's all about. Just know this, our God is big enough to handle any problem that you may incur. God is big enough to handle it. He's God. Malachi 3 says he's God and he does not change. Doesn't change. He's got your six. Remember I said the first time somebody sent me a text? Juan Rio sent me a text. Pastor Randy got your six. I sent back six what? <laughs> Military term. I should have known that. God. He's still El, El Shaddai. He is still the God who's more than enough. He's still Jehovah Jireh. He's the God that sees ahead and makes provision. He's already seen ahead of where you are. He knows where you'll be tomorrow. He's still Jehovah Jireh, the one that sees ahead. He's still Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our doctor. He's still a God that cannot lie. He can't lie. And through communion, through receiving the Lord's body and blood, we can receive healing. I know people that have been healed during a communion service. What are we doing? Are, are we anticipating anything? Are we just going through the motions? Because this is what our church does every, every now and then. We need to tap in. Add it all up and tap into what God's provided. And we can receive through Holy Communion. Paul said in, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 11.31, Examine yourself and see that you be in the faith. In other words, when you come to participate, come with the right attitude. Come with a thankful heart. Rejoice that you have somewhere to hang your hat and a nice warm bed and a good house and a good church to have fellowship and wonderful people to spend time with. Come expecting. Remind him of his promises. Come in faith. Receive what he says. Say this with me. In the name of Jesus, today I will receive everything that God has provided for me. There we go. We're going to add it all up. We're going to subtract the pants and we're going to glorify God. So what I'd like for you to do is when you come, just come from that side of the wall. I mean, even if you're over there, go over and come around and pass right by this way and go back to your seat and we won't stumble on each other. And, and listen, those cups are, are about a tenth of a centimeter thick. And if you squish them to see, you will pour juice all over yourself. What happened there? We, we died. That's all right, though. Don't crush the cups. Wait till you get back to your seat. I remember I served communion one time in our, in our basement church in Pekin. Uh, one guy there, he'd just been born again, knew absolutely nothing about nothing except that Jesus loved him and that he was born again. And we passed out the cups and I heard, crick, crick. He crushed his cup. We give him another cup. Looking around, 
I'm just looking over at him. He's it's like Paul said, when you come together to do this, wait on one another. Okay, wait on one another. I'm sure you can, you can, you can control yourself for that. So let's do that. Um, Dan, you, wanted, you ready to do that, if you will? I think it's only been like two or three times that I've ever asked Dan to do a song specifically. You guys all, all together, right? You playing this with Chuck? Just him? Were you scared of that song, are you? Okay, you, you are good, man. So, let's do this. If we'll start, Chuck, you get to be first. Go figure. <laughs> That's why I sat over there. If you will. Heart's right, your attitude is right. Get yourself prepared for the miraculous. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 11.23 says, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord Himself. On the night when He was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then He broke it in pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. The Amplified Bible says, do this to call me affectionately to remembrance. So in doing so, we're adding it all up. And we're going to believe God to fill in what we've not received yet. So let's hold the bread up. Let's bless it. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we bless you. Lord Jesus, we give you praise that you offered your body as a sacrifice for us. We give you praise today. Let us receive all of your promises in the name of Jesus. Amen. Shall we partake? In the same way. What's it mean in the same way? Again, he gave thanks. He took the cup of wine after supper saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's bless the cup. Lord, we bless you for the shed blood of the Lamb of God. For you said without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. But Lord, we give you praise. We're thankful today that we can say that you are our God. We are your children. That we are born again, adopted into your family. And let this blood, let this blood remind us of your covenant promises to us. That we are free, we are made whole, and we give you all the thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we partake? Thank you, Lord. We bless you and we give you praise. We thank you with a grateful heart. In the name of Jesus. Dan, you're going to do that again? We'll say, let's sing this. How about standing up? Let's sing this. Is Angie, is there any chance you... Oh, you're good. You're good. Give thanks.